Welcome back to Grok Talk. Brought to you as always by CNHT and GraniteRock.com. Please visit CNHT.org and GraniteRock.com. We are broadcasting from Grassroots Central in Concord, New Hampshire. The CNHT offices, which we share with Right to Work, CNHT, Concerned Ventures for America, and others, all of whom deserve your attention. Check them all out. You can look them up. They're all here in New Hampshire with us. And uh, we're here to support them, and they're here to support us, and we're all a big happy family. But anyway, let's move on to our next guest, who's been here, but quietly and patiently observing the... Mayhem. Lunatics in the insane asylum. <laughs> Mayhem's a good word. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Very good. good. How are you today? Thank you so much for coming oh. down. Michelle is a, a political activist, grassroots. Uh, you know, you're, you're up at the State House a lot. Definitely. And uh, you decided that you were going to adapt your role slightly there, hopefully? Yes, that's then, my intent. And uh, so you're going to be running for the house in Rockingham 7? That's right, right. that's Wyndham. Okay, cool. All right. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming in. Uh, we didn't really talk specifically about what to talk about, but there's so much that's been going on. I mean, you can pick any piece of outrage you like and go from there. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, there have been a lot of things going on that should outrage a lot of people right now. Um, probably yesterday's vote in the Senate t to concur with SB 120. It's probably the latest and greatest on that hit list. Mm -hmm. so, so hang on, didn't they originate it? Mm -hmm. They did. So they why did. did they have to concur with it? Was it altered by the House? Yes, it was. It, well, it, frankly, it, at least they took out uh, the requirement for membership lists to be revealed or donor lists to be revealed. So that's at least uh, an improvement. It's not as horrific as it could have been. But no. it's still, uh, it's a nightmare. They thought about uh, adding a 25-foot buffer zone to the free speech. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm combining my bills. No, no. Anyway, yeah. No, no, if they had that way, they put a 25-foot buffer zone between you and your microphone so we can hear you. But uh. well, Let's see, how's that working out for you? <laughs> I I do most of my work in print. They can take me as far away from a microphone as I want. We have shotgun mics. We do. We do 25 feet and further. Yeah. No, I, I, can't I, shut us. I was I was just we're, making we're, a, making we're, a, we're a uh, inferring point. a reference to SB 319, which was the 25 foot buffer zone around health care clinics. Yes. Yes. Be, be, because we wouldn't want the veterans to get too close to the health care. That's right. Anyway. <laughs> The 25 foot waiting list at the VA. No, it's longer than that. Anyway, I'm sorry. You, you need incredibly tiny print or, even to shrink it to 25 we have feet. To stop stealing her segment. Okay. We must behave, gentlemen. All right. So, must behave. please, if you must can remember behave. where you were. Right. Oh, certainly, times. certainly. SB 120, uh, that's that piece of legislation that redefines a PAC, so a political committee. So, it's going to hurt the smaller organizations on the left and the right. So it's going to touch the big guys at all because they can either bombard the Secretar Secretary of State's office with a flood of paperwork. That's not going to help transparency in the slightest. And it's going to uh, shut down and certainly stifle the small ones, like um, uh, some of the life groups, the NHLA, strong, uh, Citizens for a Stronger New Hampshire. It's just going to make it harder for the smaller voices to be heard. And frankly, those are the voices that need the most empowerment. I mean, it starts with it, two or more people, correct? Yeah. So one person, say, like me, just by myself, blogger, you know, I... There's work. a problem there, though. There's a big problem. And it is a possibility that I'll, I haven't gone through the whole bill just yet. I have read it. But, you know, if somebody on the left or even somebody on the right, like... Um, the rogue Republicans, or Jeb Bradley, or Odell, or Chuck well, Morris, well, well, or, or any of those folks, decide, well, you're providing aid and comfort. You're, you're campaigning against us. I spend more than $500 a year keeping Granite Rock up and rolling. I have a group of people who participate with me. They could, in an extreme, well, even if they just wanted to hassle me, could shut me down and bring me into court and say, you haven't registered. Exactly. And that's that's a huge problem. Well, I think I think they're going to have to bring in everybody because if you have two people in a comment stream on a website who happen to remark in a space where they're invited and perhaps registered to comment the same thing for an issue or against an issue on a website that probably costs thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to maintain, what's the difference? Yeah. The difference is ideological and the difference is opinion. The difference is not illegal because if two people remark in favor of or against the same issue on a platform in a digital format 
what's the difference if it's in comments or if it's posted in a blog? It's opinion, A, correct? Yeah, so what yeah. you're saying is people um, uh, performing, say, a letters to the editor campaign or a comment campaign on a newspaper uh, comment list hey. could be the same. Sorry, go ahead, yeah. Skip. We're stealing time away from Michelle again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so, but back, so, but, so but back to how bad the bill was. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to try to put us on the right track here. Why the heck are you want to go running into that crowd of chickens, as Steve put it? Why are you running? I'm running because I feel compelled to do something about it. I feel compelled that uh, there's a lot that's been going on at the State House. I've been up there anyhow for the last eight years. And so it's time for me to be held accountable and have that ability, should I be elected, to uh, be the ones to push the button instead of lobbying those people who are pushing the buttons. Okay, eight years and lobbying, the Bowing two in. phrases. Okay. Okay. Well, lobbying, I'm a volunteer. Why? I'm a volunteer. So lobbying might be a little bit of a misstatement, but uh, I've been working with the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance mm -hmm. for the last eight years, helping Very them. Hello? Helping them on uh, their oh, legislation, primarily education well, hold issues. Hold on, we, we had a and, and technical them, problem, uh, and now we're back. But, uh, so, hold on. Okay, so... Uh, we have Susan on. Oh, the line. she's absolutely fabulous. Darling, how are you? There we go. Let's try that. Susan. Susan. Am I on the wrong line? What line did she call in on? Line one. Oh, I thought she called it on line two. Let's try line two. Susan. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And now we're on the fabulous. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've corrected that problem now. It's, and it, what it's going to do for the, these small groups, the unintended consequences, it's going to be devastating. Absolutely. Oh, I'd love to. I'd absolutely love to. There's a number of things to correct up there. Well, let's talk about that. Uh, well, first off, um, there have been... Uh, some of the things about Common Core I'd like to, to correct. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been um, student privacy bills we've had to fight for that we're still fighting for. We have one more shot at one. Uh, there's just been a lot of things that have passed the last two years. If we could just repeal them, would be a big step, you know, to across the board. Um, Such as? Um, there have been some things with uh, Common Core being implemented at the state level and allowed um, that I'd like to see rolled back. Um, I'm, I'm so you've got, you've got free speech yeah. is one. That's a problem. Common it's, core. Yep. Privacy. Privacy. We've got that buffer zone bill that Steve referenced earlier. Uh, it, it, there's just a lot of things. Those are sort of the issues that I've been hanging out with. I know there are even more that if I took a closer look at them, I'd be able to give you a, a list the length of my arm. Okay, one of the things that's been in the uh, subject in the House a lot have been all these bills having to do with gun control. And make no mistake, they have been, the left is trying to disarm the citizenry to make it as hard as possible for lawful people. And this is what I just don't seem to understand. They just don't trust any of us. They think that, that we're all kids and criminals to boot and are doing anything they can to disarm us. Well, what's your feeling about that? Oh, I've been working very hard the last two years and this year in particular uh, to stop that sort of nonsense from going on. Uh, I've been the New Hampshire legislation coordinator for the Second Amendment Sisters the last few years. 
So I worked with uh, Susan Olson and Jen Coffey and a few others to keep close track of those sorts of bills and to fight them to defend our Second Amendment rights. I'd and say we did a pretty decent job this year. I mean, there's a lot of... No, no. Yeah, there were a lot of coordinated attacks from slightly different angles, trying any way they could to, to get the camel's nose into the tent. And I think we did an amazing job considering the makeup of the house this year. So is it? Dynamite. You would need to um, you would need to shame them into doing it. Something we're thinking about doing with the uh, cross check on voter ID. But anyway, can you post, Susan? Can you post that up, please? Oh, good. No, I haven't seen it to be honest with you. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Hi, Susan. All right. See you and, and, and thanks, Susan. Susan. And thanks for that uh, Scott Brown Brown out uh, pick you sent me. <laughs> Smurf Daddy's awesome. Yeah, yeah that's wonderful. Bye. 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 Okay. So, so, gun rights is certainly a big issue for you, Absolutely. obviously. Because yep. cause we we see it as just a symptom of a really bad disease the democrats and the left the progressives see it's a gun object they're looking at of you know the society in general we're saying what about individual freedom and you know what are your thoughts on those two opposing views because they are very much radically different we have freedom on one side and security and safety on another um I don't think freedom needs to be compromised for security. And I think there's that fab fabulous quote from Ben Franklin, where if you, com if you compromise for security, you, you end up... Oh, what's the, those who will the trade, caffeine hasn't the, the, kicked yeah, those, <laughs> those will trade a little secur uh, security for, or a little liberty for temporary security deserve neither. Exactly. It's, it, that's perfect. You know, you, you, if you compromise your, your liberties, you don't get them back. It's a slippery slope. You end up completely losing. It's an interesting debate, gun, guns, because we we always manage to still do okay, you know, despite all the attacks. And with, and I wonder, you know, because the left is all about emotion and, and response, which is the reason why they're so sex successful, because they do a very good job of personalizing and well terrorizing in some cases people emotionally over an issue. And um, you know, we on the right don't always do that. We're much more, you know, calculating numbers, specifics, details. You know, well, the Constitution says this, and they're like, they don't care. I mean, what if you had said, look, Chicago has some of these really strict gun laws, and 60 people died this weekend, children and everybody, and you know, those kinds of, th you know, I always talk, think about how to roll those conversations in, because people don't think about it that way. They don't go. Most people don't know that the cities with the strictest gun laws have the highest crime rates. Right. They're and just not because nobody reports that but like us. And you would know it and, and yeah. the people on the right. But it, oh. It's that emotional appeal. And I think that's part of how the, the right needs to change how they make those appeals. Still keep the facts. Still keep going for the, the information, comparing it to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. But there are ways that we can craft our message a little bit and appeal to people, like tell those personal stories of how that impacts a family. For example, uh, with the Second Amendment sisters, uh, we have a lot of women come into our shoots who have been victims of domestic assault or uh, had other issues trying to protect their family and they weren't equipped to do it at the time. So they come to us for help in initial training. And if those sorts of messages could get out more into the general public, I think 
they would start to hear things a little differently. They would start to understand why it's so important. I mean, you go, you touch upon a, a very important piece of information and another principle, that of self-responsibility and independence. Because, you know, the reason why I carry a pistol is because I can't carry the policeman on my back. The problem is, is that the Democrats, as Steve brought up, will scream, well, those little kids at Sandy Hook couldn't protect themselves. And the response should be, well, the teachers could have, because some of them died trying to protect their students anyways. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and this morning yeah. was the was the news that seven more people were murdered in Santa Barbara, California. I haven't heard all the details just yet, but it seemed to be like a drive-by. And you know, there, there are times, and I just haven't been able to figure, like, figure out how to artfully say this, but you're going to see this in the house. And my, my question will be, how would you defeat something like that, like Sandy Hook? Or this drive-by when the Democrats say, well, we have to get rid of all the guns. And you look at, you know, Jack in the Box, where the uh, Moms Demand Action have gotten them to take away guns. There's now been a couple of robberies and a murder uh, based on that. They're going after Chipotle, that uh, there was that bakery or that restaurant, and I think in New York, mm -hmm. that had the no gun sign that made the national news, and they got robbed and the whole bit. So. Uh, how are you going to, when you go to the house... We're going to wait for your answer, because we're going to take 60 seconds, but I'm going to preface it with this. The first thing I would say is, how many vets died on the waiting list? What are you going to do about health care? Be right back. You do. You just come right back at them with their crap. That's yeah. the first thing you do. Yeah. Where were you when those vets were waiting and they died on that waiting list because of government health care? What are you going to do? Don't even let them put you in a corner. <laughs> that truly is socialized medicine it is. It within is. the United States. And, and, and we have wait, waiting list management in the UK too. They, Whenever you impose standards without any kind of rigor, what you get is cheating. So in the case of the VA, they said the wait times can't exceed X, so they shoveled two-thirds of the people onto a secret list to let them die, so that the apparent wait list time met X. But nobody inspected the results to find out if, in fact, everybody was getting served. Any random sampling would have proved that. In the UK, they set, they set a limit for how long between an ambulance arriving and somebody getting help at the ER. What happened? They made the ambulances wait at a distance and come in when the patients were dying. Stop talking. Okay, we're back. And we're going to let Michelle answer that question. Steve McDonald, Skip Murphy, Mike Rogers. You're listening to Grok Talk. Our guest is Michelle Laval. Who is going to stick her toe in the sludgy pool at the state house? <laughs> yes, running with the chickens. Running with the chickens. Yeah. So before the break, I was asking, how are you going to, in, in the midst of you know, when you stand up at the well of the house, how are you going to try to defeat the emotional language that the Democrats are going to say? Look, another tragedy happened, and it's the guns that are wrong. Versus, we know it's the people that are wrong. You can never get criminals to respect the law. So additional laws aren't going, will not change that. We've seen that time and time again. As Steve mentioned earlier, look at Chicago. They've got some of the most restrictive gun laws in the country, and yet their crime and murder rates are screwed through the roof. Uh, so additional laws only hurt the law-abiding citizens. It doesn't do a thing to curb criminal activity. Now, how, how are you going to deal with the media? Because, let's face it, we've been around since 2006. Not as long as some, but longer than others, and we've outlasted others on the right as far as being part of the new media. And in that time, I've gotten much more interested in the media, and they're pretty much predisposed to hate Republicans, too. In fact, Glenn Reynolds of Instapundent, I think, has the best line of all. They're just Democrats with bylines. And I excoriated Kevin Landrigan this week for doing pretty much that with or about Bob Copeland. So the question is, what kind of techniques, or, or are you prepared with techniques to, when so, one of the reporters says, I'm going to talk to you because you know, you've been around and all of that stuff, how are you going to keep them from distorting your message? Um, That's a big I, deal here. I don't know how you can completely keep them from changing your message because they're the ones ultimately publishing it whether it's on a blog or actual print media or whatever they're going to edit what you say to to paint certain people that <coughs> in the worst possible light it, 
frankly, when I uh, worked in Chicago, even people who were trying to do a good job covering the issues um, didn't always under know the issue well enough, and so things could be misunderstood. So even with the best of intentions, people can have things a little off. Uh, but I, I think just clearly, repeatedly saying your message, it, it gets out there. People will hear it. Um, I don't want to shy away from anybody uh, and just keep talking and people will hear. But will they cover you is also the secondary question because in a lot of cases they won't or they won't do it very well. So what's your alternative? Well, there's a, there are folks like you. There's a, there's oh, a, thank <laughs> you. There's, there are some of the good guys in media as well. Uh, and I've got my own blog on school choice. So I've been using that as a mechanism to, to further issues uh, that are important to me. Um, there, there are good guys out there that are happy to get that message out there. And you, you've got to keep re appealing to your, your people, whether, like for me, it would be the folks in Wyndham, being accountable to them, being open, communicating with them on a regular basis. Uh, so that would be my intention of trying to keep that communication line open at all times. Great topic. Your own blog on, on schools. So the question is, where are you on school choice? And I'm going to phrase this. We, we have a commenter that's more left of us. He's also a teacher at a government school. His, his, one of his handles, he's got several, Balacento or Hunter Dan. Um, he's a, a local teacher. Um, thinks that Granite Rock hates public schools. The question is, where do you stand on school choice and funding and parental prerogative? Uh, I am extremely passionate when it comes to school choice and empowering parents with their kids' education, whether it be in traditional public schools, charter schools, homeschooling, it doesn't matter. I think parents need to have that ability to direct their kids' education. All right, I'll make the following statement. Children do not deserve a public education. Children do deserve public funding of their education. We're seeing now an arch government school booster, anti-school choice person having just been voted on to the New Hampshire uh, Board, Board of, of education, education by the name of Bill Duncan. Yes. And we've had our run-ins with him, who is actually, you know, one of the progenitors of the lawsuit trying to take away the tax credit that was voted in to give <coughs> those of low income school choice at the behest of what the parent thinks is I best. Know. He thinks that the schools, that the government knows best what's good for your kids. Comment, please. Oh, th that was uh, something I, a group of us worked very, very, very hard to try to stop and we campaigned, uh, we tried to get a lot of people in behind uh, to fight this nomination of Bill Duncan, call their executive council person and tell them, I mean, there was no reason for him to be nominated in the first place as a prime litigant in that lawsuit on the tax credit scholarship program. There's no reason he should have even been considered for that in the first place. Well, I think it fights way more strongly. Rather than there's no reason he should have been considered, he should have been automatically disqualified because True. of that. True. Well, not only that, but I think that he would have recused himself because of that lawsuit, but then he said, more power. Well, it gives him a bigger audience. He's against charter schools. I've, I've been up there on the same issues that he's been up there, up in Concord for the last several years. And inevitably, we've been on the polar opposite ends of the issues, whether it's uh, charter school issues or homeschool regulations. We've been polar opposites, and um, it's galling that he would be in that position for the next five years or even up to ten, because uh, those seats are five-year terms, and they can serve two consecutive terms. But they, so can al but they can also be turfed out if the subsequent governor uh, is displeased, right? Um, I've not seen that no. happen. I don't believe they can. Well, and you need a governor with some spine and a legislature willing to impeach. Can't. It doesn't work that way. Uh, I think he's impeachable the minute he sets foot in his office. <sighs> I don't think the laws run that way, unfortunately. It's just the way it is.
Once it, once you're there, pretty much in New Hampshire, you're there because of the structure of are government. Are you saying that we have a permanent bureaucratic class that uh, is not only not elected but can't be removed? Correct. They can only be from They can only be removed at, uh, when appointments come up and the governor in power chooses to appoint somebody else. Unfortunately for us, none of the people that we'd really like to get rid of have been up for reappointment when we've had a Republican governor, which is almost never in the last 20 years. And, yeah. and, 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 I, and, I, and I say he's guilty of malfeasance the minute he puts his foot in the door, and for that he can be fired by anybody who's willing to look at the law properly. Yeah, the, the, that's part of the problem with the New Hampshire form of government, where it's an extremely weak governorship. There's not much that the governor can really do Mostly it's a figurehead kind of deal, except for putting forward the nominations. Now, with a uh, Democrat governor, Democrat-led uh, Democrat executive council, there's not much of an impedance there. Um, no. Same thing with the, with the House that you're going into just you know, right now. So the question comes in, is there a way to become successful when you're up against, like an ideologue like Bill Duncan who says, government has to determine your choices, where a lot of us are over here saying we should have the choice and the freedom to choose for ourselves. How do you bridge that gap? Because I see, you know, that's the, the quintessential argument in the House. So how do you work in that group of 400 to say we, we need to move that Overton window back to the right a little bit for individual liberty? I have found uh, that we've been able to effectively change some people and guide them to those points uh, in the House Education Committee. Uh, over the years that we've been up there working towards greater educational freedom, whether it's on charter schools or homeschool issues, we've been able to work with people who are Democrats to persuade them to be more receptive to those ideas. We have come to the end of our segment. Michelle Lavelle, running for the House in Rockingham 7. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank th you. Thanks for being willing to get in there and mix it up. And yeah. how may they get hold of you to vote for you? My and website is uh, Michelle, the number four, nh.com. Excellent. Email Thank address? You. Uh, Michelle at Michelle, the number four, nh.com. All right. Thank you so much. Thank Joe you. DeLeo is up next, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, Obama's National Climate Assessment. And then after that, Jeff Chittister, stay tuned. We'll be right back. This is Grok Talk. Grok TV.